So I decided this. This car doesn't need to go win races. It doesn't need to go compete against, you know, wealthy people with their vintage Formula One cars and their Indy cars. It doesn't need to do that. What it needs to be able to do is be a great platform for students to learn on and build and is low maintenance over a long period of time because this chassis is so cool. So what was the choice was made to run the Honda K-Series. This is the K24, 2.4 liter four cylinder, readily available in a lot of production based cars. And in the United States, this particular variant was the one that makes about the most horsepower. And there's a lot of parts available for it. So in turbocharged form, as you all know from the internet, the K-Series can make up to 1,000 horsepower depending on how you do it. But in stock form, kind of unplugged, they're gonna make about 200 horsepower. Also, Grayson, where are you at? Come on over here. You can keep working. You don't have to stop just because the camera's on. I'm making him nervous. This is his first time on camera. Oh, how do you feel? Being feel honest? good. You yeah. do? You're talking quietly. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Grayson's local. He's a genius garage student. And uh, long story short, guys, I'm doing the machining on this to make the car be actually usable and all the engineering so it'll be rock solid for years to come for genius garage because the indy car will be here for doing engine building for the students so they don't have to worry about the car they can worry about building engines and tuning them and if one blows up it's not the end all end of the world but grayson was local so i said why don't you come in a day a week and we'll work on it together you can hang out and you can learn through the process and all that so dude this is like your third day here yeah how are you feeling it good i think it's going good have yeah. you learned anything yet yeah what have you learned? A few different stuff, a few structural stuff, uh, a little bit on the end of stuff. I mean, it's a lot, quite a bit of fabrication so far, so. And how weird it is to work with Casey? Yeah, <laughs> yep. <laughs> I'm talking in the third person. It's not that bad. It's kind of fun. Yeah. The people at the restaurant think we're nuts. <laughs> yeah. Because I'm a regular. So uh, what should we do with the rest of our day here? Should we show them the malarkey we're making? Mm. Let's do your stuff. Ooh, my stuff. Ooh, so check this out. Now I know some of you are gonna say that stuff is too thick, but here's the K-Series, right? K-Series fits on this flat billet aluminum pan, which was originally designed by a student a couple of years ago, but there were a couple of mistakes made, so we had to redo it. But fortunately, we were able to save the metal and make it work. You can see these two holes here, and that will be for the dry sump oiling system, and that's where the oil will be sucked for the, the pumps here. Now, don't worry about that now, we're worrying about structural stuff. This is the ad adapter plate that bolts to the billet, the billet oil pan as well as the motor at the bell housing flange and adapts it to the transaxle here. The transaxle having these six bolts that are in the shape of a trapezoid on the back. And then of course this top part called the toilet bowl of the transaxle has an area here where a plate can be bolted up at the top. But for right now, just keep your mind here, we have the engine adapted to the transmission to where the input shaft will actually go into the flywheel for the clutch and make that all work. Now, the oil pan here that's billet goes over and fits over four pins that come out of the monocoque, which is the big carbon fiber chassis here, and the aluminum, uh, you can see the bulkhead is aluminum. And those are the structural pins you can see. Those are the two at the top, there's two over there, and then there are four down there at the bottom that go into the billet oil pan. And then from below, you are able to tighten up the nuts that go on it. So right now, relating to the structure, as you can see, there's a point here, and there's a point here to the monocoque. The engine is only attached at the bottom and somewhat triangulated in this form for all you engineering types. So we have made these pieces of steel here. You can see these two here that fit nicely right over that. Pretty tight tonics, but not psychotically tight. It goes over that with just a little bit of clearance so that then you can use these jet nuts and tighten them down. Now, the reason those are there is because we need them to fit over where the car slides together. God, can I not put a nut on a tape? There we go, okay, there. I'm good at some things, I swear. Anyway, so what we're doing, this is visual. So here's the steel tubes, okay? And they're gonna get welded to structure that goes from here to here, okay? Now, I know there's a triangulation coming up, so I want you guys to pay attention. Here's DOM tubing, got a little surface rust on it, but we're just using this as a visual representation. So effectively, we need tubing to go from this area. We have to decide how we're gonna weld and take about all that and how we're gonna make it attach here. But effectively, there's going to be a top tube from the monocoque to the back. Now, the other thing we're gonna do is there's gonna be a tube that goes from approximately this point down to here. Now, I'm gonna use this. This is not the one we're using. Obviously, I'm using this as a visual reference. So this something will weld to that tube 
and it will go to a point down low. So what we're gonna end up doing is marking the billet here when this comes off, we're going to put it in the drill press and it's going to get a hole drilled here because we have these, which are two bends. Okay. And this is one half by 20 inch thread and, and a tube, there'll be a hole drilled to where that'll bolt through to it like that. And there will be a tube that goes onto the end of this that sticks out to about where my ring finger is here and welded to this obviously. And that will allow another tube to be fished mouth and weld to it right there. So what we have effectively done is make these A-arms uh, that all bolt together. And then when the car is dismantled, what you'll do is you'll unbolt the four nuts at the top and the four nuts at the bottom. And the monocoque chassis here, as well as the entire drivetrain area with the wing, the engine, the transaxle, all that, and the A-arms will split here. We'll split the car in half and it will slide apart. Obviously, you have to have your electrical, your fuel oil, cooling lines, and all that disconnected. But that's how that's going to work. So that's what we're working on right now and making these pieces here. And I want to show you how I'm doing that because we had to go gorilla style. I'm just going to keep rolling with it like this, and then Grayson's going to hold it. We don't have a lathe here. I don't have any machine tools, and frankly, we don't have enough room for it. We don't really use them that often. However, the difficulty is we need these parts now, but we need them to work. And the tube that we have been using to make these, problem was the ID of it was not big enough to just go over top of those things. And obviously you can see the flashing there where I cut it. The other problem is cutting this perfectly perpendicularly. If we had a lathe, it'd be very easy to put this in a lathe, spin it, cut it off perfectly where you need it to be, and then open up the inside with a, you know, boring, a center board kind of thing there. We don't have that. What we do have is a cutoff wheel. So as you can see, it was cut off. But even if you get it in there as perfectly perpendicular as you can, it will be slightly off. So one problem we have that has to be relieved is how do we make that perpendicular? What can we do? Can we put it in the drill press and spin it? No, it's too big. Can we hold it? Can we do it by hand? No. The other problem is the center has to be drilled out more. Fortunately, I've got a drill bit that works perfectly to do so. So what we're gonna, and then I set this up with the belt sander, which looks completely ridiculous. Um, but together here, I'm gonna show you guys how we made this. So if I may, I'm gonna give you this and you're gonna record, but don't push any buttons. Is it still recording? Okay, you got it. So got the piece here, you guys. I'm looking for safety glasses. Grayson, you see any around here? <sighs> hmm. Here we go. Eye protection is important. Like people way overdo it, but um, it's important. So come on over. Now I'm gonna show you guys. First, we gotta bore out the center better. I'm gonna take the piece and right here on this, this uh, nice machinist vise, there's a little groove cut into it. So I'm gonna find the groove and tighten it up, but not before I gotta get some of this flashing off. So I'm gonna just buzz the flashing off quick on the coarse side. One, I don't want to cut myself, and two, if there's flashing of about any thickness poking out, it may, um, it'll get in the way of uh, having it perfect, you know, in the groove and set up and as straight as I can get it. Okay. All right. Find its groove. Okay, that's in there. That's pretty nice. Now, we got that. Here's my bit I'm using. Now, since we're only gonna be taking a little bit off the center, um, a drill bit has a tendency to grab too quickly. So you gotta go a constant rate and get your speed the right way. I've got this adjusted relatively slow, but not as slow as it can go. I'm gonna use double WD-40 a little bit as a coolant, but also as a lubricant. Um, it's a little messy, but it, it does. it is in fact working well. Okay, so safety glasses are on, everything's like that. It's gonna work just fine. I'm gonna spray just a little on there, a little on the bit, and we're gonna start. I'm gonna put my hip right here. I know this looks terrible. Don't be like that, what are you doing? There we go. The bit's getting a little dull. God damn it. So yeah, I pushed, I just slipped and pushed a little too hard and it, it bound and grabbed. It's a little tricky to do. Also, I'm doing it on the camera and this, this looks 10 times more sketch. So judge me if you will, but it's working beautifully. And we're doing the best with, we can with what we got. And in a second, when I get this done, I'm gonna tell you guys a lesson about doing the best you can with what you got. 
I swear it won't be a boomer lesson, but it might sound like one. And honestly, there's nothing wrong with a boomer lesson, if it's good now and then. Okay, it's poured out. Okay, so the lesson time. Do the best you can with what you got. And if you don't have the specifically the exact tool you need, like a lathe would be nice, we don't have one. So I have to think about how can I do this at a 90 degree angle? How can I do a good enough job? Honestly, this drill bit, I don't know where the heck it came from. It's some old piece of junk I've had forever, but it happens to be the exact size I needed. And I found it in a pile. So I bring that up because, and this is also my way of getting back to stupid people, which sometimes you need to do in life. People who don't want to try hard, they don't want to work, and they don't believe they can ever get anywhere, like to see anybody else who has any modicum of success and write off their success to have, say, it was handed to them. Because if the person that was successful was known that they actually came up with some brilliant way and worked hard and tried and got somewhere, then that would make the people who didn't try feel worse about themselves. So that's why people like to do that. But I bring that up because finding clever ways to do this is just one small token of everything. So you guys may not be able to afford something great. You may not have the right tool, you know, but if you think and use your hand, you have some good old fashioned blue collar trades, you know, workmanship, then you might be able to do something special. Work on something, fix up an old Lamborghini or take an old Indy car and fix it up. So here's what we got. Here's a part I put it in the water because it was a little hot to touch. Now what I'm gonna do is see, did the boring work? Will this fit on there now? Sure did. And with, and I'm going by eyeball feel, just enough, just enough clearance to be perfect. Now you'll notice that this is longer than the shoulder. It needs to be longer so that the nut will bottom out and push this into the bulkhead before it bottoms out on this pin. So now what we need to do is, this is not perfectly perpendicular. I'm gonna show you guys what I created to make this work. So I got my, this is my, uh, my sander here. And we've got the discs. This is a nice, flat, perfect plane. And this is parallel to it. So what I did is I took this three quarter inch square steel tubing and I clamped it to the edge of this perfectly on the edge. Then I took my 90 degree magnet here and this piece of steel, check this out guys, fits in that magnet perfectly. So I know now, based on this being a 90 degree angle and this being perfectly parallel to this, that this, if I hold it here, will buzz it perfectly straight. Now what I'm gonna do is I wanna show you guys this. Look at the coloration here. You can see some discoloration, you can see how it is. Cut off wheel right there. Same thing with here. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna initially just touch this a little bit to it, and also I'm gonna check the screen to make sure this is working. Bop, bop, yes it is. So guys, I'm gonna start with this just a little bit and do half the job and then show it to you so you can see how it was uneven. Here we go. Okay, now take a look here. You'll be able to see it. You can see that this area at the top has been buzzed and that has not. This area was low, that was clearly a high spot. So I'm gonna keep going a little bit. Now, because this is perpendicular, it does not matter how this orients. It's still gonna get it perpendicular. So all I have to do is stick it back in here and slide it back up. The other thing is if you come around here, come over here, cameraman, you can see the sparks going all the way around. Well, that helps let me know, is it touching the whole way or is it just doing one corner? You can see the full width of sparks. So that tells me, now you can see it's shiny the whole way. That tells me that I've now gotten this perfectly perpendicular and flat. So what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna put it in the water to cool it down because if I go touching it, I'll burn myself. And I wanna burn myself. I also want to take off the least amount of material because if I take off too much, I'll ruin this because it'll no longer be long enough that the bolt will bottom out on it first. But you can see that still fits on real nice. And now it'll have a perfectly perpendicular place for this jet nut to bottom out. But just for the eyeball test, I'm going to flip it around. I'm going to check it on the monocoque here. I'm going to come over to the side so I can see if there's any gap. I'm going to spin it. And I can tell you that there's no gap and that is flawlessly perpendicular and I was able to do it with no lathe. Now this is not a whole lot different. When you put it in there and spin it, it's kind of like if you're lapping valves, you put them in there and spin it if it's off a little bit. So it's just, this is just basic good old fashioned ingenuity. And I guarantee any good fabricator 
that isn't a jillionaire with a big shop or a farmer has had to do clever stuff like this in the past. All right, I'll tell you one other lesson after this in a moment. I'm gonna go ahead and hit this. I'm gonna show you how we did it. All right, I buzzed it just a little. You can see that this half was hit. That's the high spot. So now I gotta keep going until it hits the low spot as well. Here we go. Excellent. Take a look here. You can see that it buzzed it the whole way around and that's perpendicular. So we're gonna take it over to the car. I'm gonna check it. Oop, a bunch of junk came out. That's all right. Looks good. All right, so what I'm gonna do is come over here, guys, and I'm gonna hit the edge. I'm just gonna do this by hand, push the magnet out of the way a little bit. Just gonna hold it at an angle, spin it. It's not imperative that this is flawlessly chamfered, but I can do a good enough job. Alrighty, where's that towel? So, so that's how you did it, guys. We don't have a lathe and we don't have all the right tools and we didn't have a pipe that fit perfectly. But with just the basic things we have and using our head, we were able to make this part fit perfectly. It's nicely perpendicular, nicely chamfered. And now we have something worthy of using on this incredible Indy car. So we hand fit these and we have four tubes for every single one. So that gets us in a great place. Now I wanna bring something up about this too. I said that any person with their own garage fabrication, any farmer gets it. So some of you may know the family business when I grew up was a little public golf course in Ohio. It's now defunct because 2008 destroyed the industry. Uh, but that's neither here nor there. We worked hard. Our family had to maintain every single mower, every single tractor, every single golf cart, all the grounds, all the agronomy, 120 acres, all the environmental impact, and then also manage the business. But the only thing the people saw on the outside were wearing a polo shirt in khakis if there was a golf thing going on or the front side of it. So I was just the rich kid, even though we were the ones responsible firsthand of maintaining an entire fleet of internal combustion and electric vehicles and maintaining 120 acres. So I bring that up also because never write somebody off for being successful. They may have had to use a lot of ingenuity to get themselves there. And just think about all the farmers working hard and having to maintain and repair their equipment. It's not glamorous, but there's a lot of smarts going on there that we all need. So I just wanted to say that. Anyway, I got this part made. So let's talk about some other things going on because we'll come back to it. And we're about ready to make the structure. So you can see right here, this plate, this is on the K-series. That's where the water pump was, but it was this big, ugly water pump and that gets away in the structure. We're gonna, we're gonna use this tube as a visual aid. We may use a smaller tube in diameter, but it works. So that goes in there, but it's starting to hit the manifold. Now we notice the stock manifold, how it comes up and wraps around actually works perfectly. And it's gonna fit over this tube real nicely. And don't forget that we're still gonna have a one triangulating coming in down here. Okay, but for right now, what we have to do is make the corners. These are the important spots right here that have to bolt together. So we have to make these. We have to make the parts down here. We're gonna to have to take this plate off and drill it. And then later when we get the plate, we're gonna to have to make this. And when we have all three of these corners on both sides, these tubes that bolt onto the pins, this plate that goes here, and then also the, the tube end with the tube and the bolt drilled. When we have all those things that can be bolted down solidly, then we can take whatever tubes we're gonna use and start connecting the dots and then tack weld them and weld them nicely, both on the car and off, and then we will have made our A-arms, which will be perfect. And that's how you build the structure, but and that's what's been holding this car back for so long, and the reason why I wanted to work on it, so that, you know, Genius Garage has the Lotus Exosphere, has the Daytona prototype, and the old yellow Corvette up here, which has been great and helped with a lot of jobs and such. They all teach different things, they're all helpful. We can go race them. But I know that lots of students have wanted to build engines. But the problem with engine building is it's a massive curriculum on its own. You could easily get a four-year degree and then a master's and doctorate on engine building. So to think that students can learn everything they need to know about engine building in a couple months is crazy. But it doesn't mean that it, it wouldn't be a cool thing if we can give them an opportunity to start to learn. So the Honda K-Series is a great place to start and this is a really great platform for it. And since we have the Exosphere, which is an open wheel fast car, 
it can suit the job of maintaining something high end and understanding how to tune something really amazing like that for the part of learning in the jobs. And then this one doesn't have to worry about having that job. So we have this, this motor, which stock makes 200 horsepower and is on gasoline, but this platform was designed for 800 horsepower burning methanol, which runs cooler. But still the cooling system is far more than adequate for what the K-Series can do. The gearbox, the brakes, everything about it is far, far, far overkill for what this motor can do. So the exciting part about that is, this is our first one. Let's run this naturally aspirated. It's gonna be a backup. We can get the whole car built and tuning and all that jazz. But then the next thing we can do is we can find another motor identical, used one, and then the students can start building that. And then all the work that both myself to get it started and other students do in terms of creating a first step of it, then that can translate to the next motor that they get to build and learn the lessons on and, and figure it out in an environment. Now, we're not gonna build it to blow it up, but if it were to blow up, you don't have as massive amount of money invested, at least in the basis, you know, parts starting expensive, but far less money than something else when a motor like this may only cost 800 to $1,000 in total. So that's, that's why I'm making the effort and really making this overkill because I want them to have an opportunity to build an engine and learn that. I think that's really neat. And I'm excited that this car, which is a very exciting car for Genius Garage to have is something that can be valuable again. So the last thing I'll tell you guys is, uh, as you'll notice, it's in the back. Come on over here and we can just look around. So the back here is where I do most of my stuff and also do a lot of YouTube. And frankly, I'm gonna be honest, the only reason Genius Garage can exist anymore is because I do my own YouTube and give it exposure. Um, the world is not remotely as nice as everybody thinks it is, which is amazing because I think most people think the world is terrible. It's very difficult for a nonprofit to exist. Well, I don't charge any students to be here. So fortunately, I'm able to give that exposure and make it work. Um, and come walk with me. Don't die, don't trip and die, Gray. Thanks for grabbing the camera. Um, you know, Genius Garage up front has a fair amount of room, as you can see here with the cars, but we had to bring the Indy car with the table in the back where there's more room so that here we can finish the Daytona prototype. We can fit, keep working on the Exosphere. You got the carts and the sprint car up there. I had to jam the zero up here for now because that's my workspace in the back. So it's just kind of the relationship there. Maybe someday someone or some corporation will support millions of dollars so Genius Garage can have its own stuff. But until that time, I'm going to donate, you know, my spot and tools and things to be able to work on it. And so we have this great work area and with Grayson um, making this be something so it can be utilized for the students for engine building and such in the future. You guys can see here, we've got a cool turbo. Oh, I'm going to fall and die. We've got a turbo. And if you want to see about where that's going to go, come on over here. And this is pretty neat. So it's going to get mounted right about here, which is in the back of the side pod uh, above the Venturi. And um, the tubes, we have stainless steel tube coming, which we're going to take and mock up, which will go right there into the, uh, the turbo. And then this is where the exhaust will come out. You can see the, ooh, turbo blades, yay. But anyway, it'll get mounted like right about here. And then it'll be a straight three inch pipe out the back. They'll go whoosh, like straight out the back. That's cool. And of course you got your, uh, your wastegate, external wastegate, which will blow it in there if you need. But then here's the intake, which we're gonna probably run and have a filter up here, because there's two scoops where to get dead cool air. And then we'll clock this so that this tube will come and run through here. And this is where the original turbo was in the bell housing of the Indy car. We're not gonna do it like that. There's a bunch of constraints. But what we are gonna do is put inside there a water to air intercooler to cool it. So what's really cool is the entire length of the charge, the pressure side of the intake will only go right through here. You have your air water intercooler and it'll come over there to the intake side. I'm gonna show you what we're thinking there. We're gonna modify the stock intake, which is pretty neat really. So here's the second half of the stock intake and we're gonna get rid of all that stuff with the coolant going through it and whatnot. We're gonna cut off this flange and we're gonna get another flange and we're gonna weld it on straight. So your throttle, your butterfly will be here, it'll be mechanical throttle and it'll, it'll tube will just go right through there. So it's only gonna be this long. So you're not gonna have all these miles and miles of cockamamie tubing. So you'll be able to reduce lag quite a bit, but be able to cool it. And with the, we have a big water radiator here. We also have two others that can make it so it's only half a water radiator. And the other side could in fact just be for the, uh, the water from the intercooler. Or what we may try is this is a very nice CNR radiator. This alone, this radiator alone is potentially enough to cool this whole motor up to like four or 500 horsepower. So if all the cooling of the, the motor is on the left side, then that means we can leave this radiator for cooling the intercooler. And then we have an air to oil 
cooler here for the motor. So if this ends up being more than enough radiator for the intercooler, which it probably will be, um, and, but if everything else is, if the oil is cooling fine and the coolant's cooling fine, then that's fine if it overcools, we can always block some of it off. But we could also, if need be, if it overcools the intercooler and we've got extra cooling capacity, we could run an inline um, water to oil uh, uh, heat exchanger um, to utilize some of the cooling effect of the water for oil if need be. Um, but we also have the ability to change out the left side to be half and half. So we could make half of one side for cooling the intercooler over there, which might make sense because there's, you know, stuff, we got room in the side pot over there. And then we can use this for the engine, water radiator, and then half of that for it as well. So um, that can also work. So that'll be a fun experimentation with the students in the future and getting data. But um, that's what I'm working on, guys. Um, yeah, and come on over here and look this way if you don't mind. I frankly love it if the students were able to just do all this and have all the experiences, but I'm gonna be honest, and I hope you guys understand this. After a decade of working with college students uh, in engineering and high-end stuff, and I mean this in the nicest way possible, college students have had only had so much life experience, fabrication experience, and experience with tools. And a lot of the things here are frankly well beyond even the most talented and smartest college student on the planet's expertise. So that's where I have to jump in and help them or frankly do some of this work so it will be up to a standard that the things that they do and learn they'll be able to make it go because um, you know the one sad thing about YouTube is a lot of the builds you guys see on YouTube that look really cool on the screen are garbage. They're garbage cars, they're not going to handle, they're not going to drive, they're not going to do anything and I built cars and race cars in the real world before I ever did YouTube so for Genius Garage I want the students to have the experience to where they're actually working toward a bar of something working in the real world. And that's why they end up getting amazing jobs from HR people and CEOs of Fortune 500 companies and manufacturers because they know that this isn't just YouTube BS, this is real high level stuff. And also in building an organization like Genius Garage, even though we have modest means by in terms of being a uh, big educational organization and mostly it falls on my shoulders of time, um, I don't mind making that sacrifice, but I do want Genius Garage to continue to grow and be something worthwhile. So creating this car into something that can teach with motor building in an exciting and safe way while they're also learning about you know, high level stuff, um, I think that's the best we can possibly do. Um, as a side note regarding YouTube, I'm excited to see if Rob Dom finishes IndyCar and how that goes. I believe he also has a champ car of a sim similar era. Looks like he's got a nice engine for it, the original but it does appear that his rolling chassis um, not in the best condition. So I think he's gonna have a lot of work there, uh, but I'm excited and hope that he finishes that one day. And who knows, maybe we'll get to do something together, but um, you know, Genius Garage got our own things to do. So that's the video guys, I hope you've enjoyed it. I'm kind of being a little more chill in real world. Um, I just, I'm frankly really just over the theatrics of YouTube and, and stuff and I just wanna be real and be honest and hopefully that's the most helpful thing to everybody and if people don't like real and honesty well then maybe they're there for the wrong reasons and i don't want to feed into that but i hope you guys learned something and enjoyed this um and even if you didn't i guess it doesn't matter because i'll get to teach and help people get jobs with that and that's the whole reason i ended up on ben wiki and here in the first place is to try to help genius garage grow see you guys next time